to boggle a little bit. And it's very clear to me, a lot of people are very confused about, you know, just how they should apply body and blade in order to get the best out of their, um, uh, their, their sport. Um, so that's one of the things I'd like to address this evening. The other thing is, you know, the question, well, you know, is padding such an unnatural act that, you know, uh, we have to sort of apply so much science to it to actually make it enjoyable even and get it, get it, get it correct and, and, and get pleasure from it. And then, and that's, that's an interesting discussion itself. Other discussion points are the idea of paddling in a dynamic fashion or a static fashion. What do they mean? Um, and in addition, in, in addition, you know, the reality that of course every single person is unique. And I have to say that, oh, again, over my years of paddling, um, you know, it's, it's particularly in solo paddling if, if sports, it's rare to see two paddlers that look the same. I mean, literally identical. Um, in team sports, you can see a little bit more of that, to that, uh, that for sure. But in terms of actually uh, looking at individual sports, um, whether it's Aria canoeing or Soul Sup, um, so many paddlers seem to be just slightly different than, 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 than their peers. And so, you know, this evening really is to sit down and have some good conversation about this and throw, throw questions at me for sure. Anything that confu you're confused about, um, we can then um, address. So, um, does we get the questions, anything from you, Chris, at the moment? Uh, yeah, I'm just um, bringing them up a minute, Steve. Um, we've got a few people joining in well, rather quickly now. So I'm just going to, if everyone can hear me, if you can fire your questions through via the chat or the Q&A, that would be great. Um, I can then record, uh, get these over to Steve. Um, so just a quick question from, from me, Steve, is um, you, could you just uh, explain to us how, how long have you actually, your own personal paddling career how, how long have you been paddling whether that is stand-up paddle boards or uh, outriggers um, and the fundamental changes what would you say is the biggest fundamental change that you you would have seen in um, just to kick this off in, in and it's a very basic question but in blade size um, and then I'll fire the other questions through to you bit of a loose one but um, we'll wait for some to come in no that's okay um, my okay I'm I'm nearly 60 years of age and um, so I, I paddled, started paddling kayaks when I was seven. Uh, so I paddled kayaks from seven to the age of about 17, 18 and I went into windsurfing for some quite some time, so professionally. Got into outrigger canoeing for, for the best part of 30 years, um, still doing that now and stand up paddle boarding, doing that for, I don't know, I think it was 2004 or thereabouts, I got involved, so a reasonable amount of time as well. Um, a career person that had a normal job, all I've ever done is paddle, write books, travel the world, and be a bit of a beach bum to be up to be fair and an educator. So uh, I have competed at high levels, you know, more tie five times, and lucky enough to win that twice um, in, in team canoes. So you know, I'm sort of uh, quite well rounded in, in terms of the, the paddle sports. Um, look, you know, one of the, you know, you talk about paddles. You know, absolutely fascinating topic um why because that's the tool of your tool of trade is what you need to to understand most of all in, in terms of you know that as a tool how it's going to propel propel you through water now interestingly over the years uh, as uh, through, if you look at outrigger canoeing and certainly we've seen this with standard paddle boarding but uh, there was a big change in paddle designs in the late 70s and early 80s of, of paddle designs in in outrigger canoeing they borrowed them from from uh, from kayaking, uh, sorry, from canoeing, uh, whitewater canoeing, and that sort of thing, and brought them into the sport. And they actually introduced t tops, and at those times, t tops were illegal. Like in the mid seventies, you couldn't use a t top. Uh, some guys from Illinois turned up with a t top, raced across the channel, and Molokai won it with these t tops. Everyone was complaining. Then they discovered in a cave in in uh, that, uh, in Hawaii that they had actually found uh, an ancient paddle with a t top. So they said, "Oh, okay, it's traditional. You can go ahead and use it." And then it developed from there. But more to the point, the, the, the blades have gone from 10, 12 inches down to sort of uh, eight inches. So higher stroke rates, bigger aer aerobic thresholds and so forth were being used. And uh, th that changed the sport completely. But what it also did, it meant you had to change your paddling style. So 
the long loping Hawaiian paddling style had to change and became you know more sort of uh, chilly dipping and faster stroke rates. Stand up paddle boarding, pretty much the same thing to be fair. I mean, if you remember rightly, the sports started out with great big water whackers. So, for an example, I mean, if you remember that this is like a this is actually an outrigger paddle, but I mean this is a Kealoa, and when they first came out, um, they just basically. This is also a kilo, but this is their stand-up version. It's exactly the same. This was produced 10, 10 years ago. Um, and then we saw, you know, massive change, you know, with the introduction, say, of something like, like this, which by comparison is, is quite small and, and, and completely, you know, different in many ways. You know, it's, uh, it's got, a, got little concaves and a spline running down the middle and super, super strong, super light. And it, it changed the face of paddling because it all of a sudden um, it, it, it changed the way we had to move, move our body. And one thing about blade area, I would say, this is really, really important. So please listen to this. This is really key. Um, again, in outrigger canoeing, we never got strung out about blade area. We never, well, we did, but not in the way that stand-up does. So in, in stand-up paddleboarding, People look at the stats and say it's got so many square inches or square centimeters, and they'll go, they'll get all sort of bend out of shape and think, oh, yeah, well, I need this one, I need this one because of my body mass. Yes, I, I understand that. But what you need to be really key, focused on is the actual shape of the, the blade itself. So, you know, if you have a very long, a tall blade, you know, for example, uh, a high, high aspect paddle, you can actually it might be quite a large blade area in total but it might be six inches wide and you can determine how much that blade you want to use you know whereas if you're using a teardrop blade it's a little bit different so what do i mean by that well okay so this is traditionally more of your teardrop it's got quite pronounced shoulders here for example which helps to tuck it under the rail of the board um and then if you go to something like this this is one of the. This is actually a wing paddle from um, from C4 produced some years ago. One of the early sort of uh, high aspect paddles. You can see it's it's got very long, long, long sides and quite a, and then a very steep shoulder here. So it's a different sort of paddle. The blade area, the center of effort, sort of here. You know, so that's a very different tool. So you have to learn how to use that tool tool differently. So. Again, very, very complex uh, area of, of, of concern if you really want to sort of get into the nitty gritty of, of paddling. And of course, you know, depending on what you own and what you use, it will dictate to some, some extent your style, how, how you're going to use that. Um, so that, that's in brief, Chris. <laughs> yes, ma massive topic. Questions are flying in through uh, now, Steve. Okay. Um, so Lisa's asked, um, and we'll, we will jump from lots of different topics um, in this session. Uh, what is a good technique that you would recommend for paddling upstream or, or into the wind, upwind? Okay, so look, rule of thumb, big, heavy, strong people will tend to be, you know, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna muscle their way up, 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 upwind or upstream. That's, it, going up, upwind or upstream is always about muscling your way up. On, and now in the absence of having, a lack of size and lack of strength. Um, you know, one of the things you need to work on is you've got to, you've got to do something such as in, increase your stroke rate because every time the blade comes out and you're swinging through uh, laboriously and slowly and you're lengthening that out, you've got more deceleration time. So you're going to be wanting to work the front of the stroke, chopping, 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 keeping going. That's the rule one. Rule two is if you're a small paddler, you want to be paddling in a more dynamic style. In other words, you need to get over the blade, over the stroke, and use your body weight because that mass will make up for a lack of sheer strength. Now, tall, strong people can, can approach this a little bit differently. They've got longer levers. So one of the ways that they, that they could approach it, you know, is... is you know, a big reach out front, but get out early and try to work again, work in the front of the stroke and keeping that rating going. Because if you go too past, far, far past the hips, you've got a big recovery, that's downtime, you're going back, your glide time is virtually zero on a, in, in that situation. So 
um, that that would be the, uh, the the best the best way to to approach it. So look at your body size, look at your so your strength yourself, and, and work out what's going to work for you. I mean, generally speaking, most ladies are better off as sort of a shorter a shorter sort of more aggressive sort of front of stroke attack to this with a higher stroke rate working working up up when the other thing about up paddling up when here's here's a, just another tip for you um, if you're ever in a, a quite a wide open space you need to go up when try not to go up when what do I mean by that paddle slightly off the wind you know take take five degrees off it eight degrees off paddle a little bit one way a little bit the other way a little bit once a zigzag um, that's okay but we have this mindset straight into the wind not always a good thing <laughs> so uh, hope that helps yeah great answers there um steve um we've got I'll, I'll, like i say I'll, I'll fire these questions as they're coming through so i've got a question from james donovan um he's james is asking do you think that sup has gone too far into the dynamic with um little to no focus on what the hull of the board is doing in the water yes look i know, I know what he's asking here um Dynamic paddling requires you know, a, lot, a lot of body movement and, it, and to be fair, you know, one of the things that you, we observe when you watch, particularly you, a lot of people racing, um, and it, it carries on from racing into recreational, you'll see a lot of this sort of, you know, the body's doing this, boom, 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 yeah, and just a lot of power going and energy going into to driving down on the board. Now, from a designer's perspective, for example, I design a board, uh, a board uh, called the Vortex with Mistral. Um, now, that board is designed for static paddling. You know, you've got to be a little bit more, you know, either got to be a very smooth dynamic paddler or you've got to be a very, you know, very sort of controlled static paddler to get away with it. Otherwise, bad things happen. So, what do I mean? And the, and the point of this question, I think what he's getting at is that very few designers are actually saying, well, I'm designing this board for dynamic paddlers and I'm designing, or I'm designing it for static paddlers. And the reality is that if you want a board that's going to handle dynamic padding, like a lot of, you know, body weight going into the stroke, you know, thrusting yourself, throwing yourself forward, and even with a rotation to sort of to mitigate some of that, that downward thrust, you need a lot of volume. You need a lot of volume to counteract that thrusting downwards. You can do it to some extent in outrigger canoeing where you need a lot of, lot of weight, say in a six man outrigger canoe where the weights, you're having to take on a lot more by ratio a lot more uh, weight and mass onto the blade with every stroke with stand up you the, the the ratios are smaller so you actually you need to actually have bores that that, uh, that can handle uh, that, that should be um paddled in a smooth way and of course unless you've got a board of massive volume that's never going to be the case that being said some boards are quite meaty at the front and meaty at the back so it can give you that that ability to 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 sort of smash away dynamically but Let's be clear, dynamic paddling does not necessarily mean you should just be going like this. It should mean you should twist. You, know, you need to twist, you're twisting and going down and then you're twisting on the way back up again. If you just do this, you're just pounding the front down. But if you, if you, if you rotate the body, you, know, you rotate as you go down, rotate this way back up, then you mitigate it because you're coming, you know, you're smoothing that stroke out with emphasis on, on lateral pull rather than just going straight down. Okay, so, answer to that is yes i think you know designs have not been well thought in, re in respect of dealing with dynamic paddling so while we're talking uh, about the actual paddling um chris is asking how can you reduce uh, the time to change from one side to the uh, to another any tips on that one steve uh look drills are drills are really important you know um look the 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 longer your blade, your, the longer your, your paddle is from tip to grip, it's always going to be harder. It's a harder thing to manage. So you're not going to be able to flick it from one side to the other as, as, as quickly. So the shorter you can go, the quicker you can get it from, from left to right. Um, you've got to go out and do drills on flat water days and in choppier days. You, you've got to just put the time in. So you're going to literally go out in the water and go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And you're just going to keep on doing it. Just just get 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 used to wielding in that thing like a sword so you, you really have to have it to the point where that thing is thought the, the whole shaft feels really comfortable for you and you can throw the thing around in any way you like um, so the other thing about that is look if you draw the blade out too late 
then that's going to make a problem in terms of your recovery time because you've got to come all the way from the back of the stroke and bring it all the way back around. So on that point where you've made your mind up, I'm going to change on the next, you know, you're reaching out, applying the blade, taking up the load, you're pulling through, make the exit early, okay? Make it early out and then swing it through, take up the, the shaft, and then leaning forward, take the next stroke. So out early, shorter paddle, shorter blade if you can, or total paddle length if you can, um, do some drills, work on four or five strokes per side, go out, just do that for 15 minutes, just go out and just knock yourself out. But really that is the only way is to get, uh, your fine motor coordination becomes really key in this. Most of paddling is, 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 mo is gross motor mo movement to some degree, but I think that the fine motor skills are really key to, to learn. Yeah, we, um, I'm sure everyone's going to be chomping at the bit to get on the water in this lockdown period at the minute, Steve. A um, couple of questions coming in. Um, one from Andy saying, what are the best ways to train during lockdown while we can't get on the water? Uh, and Minna is asking, how can we train to increase our paddle strength and increase stroke rate on land if we haven't got access to the water? Are there some good online Zoom YouTube sessions that you'd recommend? Anything that you've seen um, out there? Yeah, look, this is this is a really tough one, and of course, you know, I think what what's hitting home to people now is a re is a, is a real sort of wake up call, which is that in fact that you know a lot of people spend a lot of time on the water training, but not enough time on land doing stuff too. You know, whether that's riding a mountain bike or swimming lengths to the swimming pool or doing some doing some uh, gym work or whatever it might be. The caveat to that is that I'll get around to the questions more specifically, but the caveat on that is that look around the world globally with all the canoes and kayakers in the world who live and say if you live in canada you're going to have three to four months a year you just cannot get on the water it's frozen solid it's freezing cold just never going to happen yet canada is a massively uh, sort of prodigious area of canoeing and stand up but so because of that they they they're already they they plan for for this this way ahead they know they're not going to go on the water so they they have paddling uh paddling adapt um row machines and ergos and things in the house they have weight systems they have stretch bands they have sessions at the gym they go swimming and they're working on these things so that when they get back in the water you know they they are they are good to go um it is quite difficult because if you want to fully replicate the paddling stroke, the best the best means of doing that is either a on an actual uh, stand up paddleboard, or it's going to be um, you know some form of simulator. Um, so there are online there's a few ideas going around at the moment about you know what, how you could simulate uh, the, the 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 paddling stroke uh, using using rubber bands and and so forth. So I would I would certainly have a search for those things. But is it, it really, really, and it could, it's simple. It's as simple as having a, a you know, a strong stick, some very strong rubber bands, and a bit of imagination. <laughs> that sounds a little bit wacky, but there you go. Um, you, you really want to don't, you know, you, you, you really want to focus on keeping that strength, uh, strength going. And you want now the aerobic side of things is, is a bit trickier. But again, a lot of paddlers are very, very poor at working at their aerobic capacities because it's very difficult to get your heart rate up on a stand-up paddle water or even in a canoe. Sound crazy? It's the truth. Very, very hard to reach a maximum heart rate in a canoe or stand-up is very, very difficult to achieve. So you, this is why training off water is essential. So it could be, and it's gotta be crazy stuff like running up hills, running up flights of stairs, uh, doing stuff which really pushes the envelope or making that, your heart work. Riding a bike, yeah, it's okay, but only if you start going up hills. You've got to really find the areas where you're going, you're maxing yourself out. I mean, notwithstanding your medical conditions and making sure you got, you're going to not, not um, do yourself any injuries. But yeah, those are the sort of things. I mean, swimming is incredible sport. Swimming itself, I mean, you can't go swimming at the moment. If you could, swimming is absolutely fantastic for, for as a cross training sport for, uh, for all paddle sports. So no magic pill there, guys, but as I say, there are ways to simulate uh, the uh, stuff paddling strokes using, you know, some form of rudimentary DIY bits of gear lying around. So I would say get online, look for those sort of devices, frankly. Yeah, <clears throat> we live in a world, don't we, Steve, where information is readily available um, online, um, but not all of that, as we know, is is um, beneficial. Um, it's 
preaching the wrong techniques and stuff. So is there any one site that you've come across that you think, mm, that's really good. I like what they're saying. Obviously, um, we've got your wonderful book that's out there, a bit of a plug, but uh, if paddlers don't know about that, I would certainly recommend um, looking to purchase Steve's book. But is, is there any online sites that you've seen, Steve, uh, that you think, right, that, that they're really good? Yeah, look, online, you know, um, rightly or wrongly, I try to avoid a lot of them because I get just as confused as, as, as the, the novice and uh, even as, an, as a so-called expert. And, you know, I, I'm not even saying that I am one, but I'm certainly, I should be better knowledge, for, have more knowledge than most. But on the other hand, you know, I still get confused when I look at, um, you know, if I watch some uh, some video from some guy who I respect, he can say stuff that I go, really? And then I get to realize that, um, you know, this comes back to me. I don't know how many people I've coached and trained over over so many years in, in this country and overseas. Um, most without really canoeing, I admit, but I've done a lot of work with stand-up over 10 years as well. Um, and um, one thing that's always struck me is that, for example, 10 years ago, I'd, I went to down in, I was down in uh, nearly 10 years ago, I was in uh, um, with, with starboard guys down there and we were, there's a whole bunch of us, we went paddling on the river. And everyone was very green then and they looked at me paddling and said, oh, wow, I want to paddle like you, you know, and I was thinking, yeah, well, okay, that's neat. That's, uh, okay, fair enough. I can understand why they probably wanted to because they were seeing, it looked visually good and I wasn't, it, was, it looked like effortless effort and I was moving really well. And they were a bit clunky and of course they would be because most of them were abject beginners in many respects. But then of course, and then I started coaching and training people. And one thing I, it took me a long time to realize this, but no one's ever going to paddle like me and I'm not going to paddle like Travis Grant. I know he won't paddle like me and I'm not going to paddle like Connor Baxter and Connor Baxter. You know what I mean? It's just going to go on and on there exponentially. I mean, it, that's how it is. You're not going to paddle like the next person. What you can get is a small facsimile that you get close, but you're never going to be identical. And that's because of these individual differences. And so my, you know, when you go to these sites, be very careful because, you know, if a guy's six foot three, an Olympian, big hairy chest and lots of gold medals, you know, yeah, he's my man. But if you're five foot three, you may as well be talking Swahili because at the end, at the end of the day, you can't physically paddle like him ever, period. Why? Because the levers, your levers aren't the same. He's musculature his skeletal system his uh, aerobic capacity his years of training i mean these are things you just don't have and so well very possibly don't have if you are a guy six foot three and similar and happy days you know maybe look at that but it's key that you match your physiology to the person that's giving the information to some extent you know i think people are quite you know i think and it's only because I've had I've had so much experience with this now. I mean, because when I used to paddle outrigger canoes, I was the smallest guy on my team of six by a long way. The tallest guy was six foot nine. I'm five foot seven. Just to give you an idea. Everyone was over 100 kilos. I'm 75 because I sat at the front of the boat as a stroker. I had to learn how to paddle like a tall guy. When it comes to teaching sup, that's the first thing I look at. How tall are they? How wide are they? The ectomorph, mesomorph. You know, fast twitch muscle, slow twitch muscle look at them and then say, well, let, how can we get the best out of you? Forget me. It's not important how I paddle or anyone else paddles in the world. It just it, how can we get the best out of you? So I could, I could recommend going to some sites, but I mean, the only, play, the only one I've been looking at recently is probably Paddle Monster. I know some of the guys there, you know, I mean, Travis Grant's a very good friend of mine. Uh, I listened to Larry Kane. So shall I work with through Mistral? You know, I used to, she used to had two or three years with, with her, with Mistral. And, um, you know, but again, they still can make the mistake at times of, of it's their perspective about them, how they paddle, and uh, you know, but not not always. They do they do give, they do give you a caveat, you know, which is everyone's different. Um, so that's that's your protection mechanism. Go, out, you know, make sure, <laughs> you know, be honest with yourself. Who am I physiologically speaking? You know, what am I? capable of and then it, it, and then, and this is in terms of if you were racing if you're not racing you just want to go and, and mo let's face it most of us don't we just want to go paddling and have a good time out on the water be safe be injury free so you know a lot of what they're talking about is just way beyond your remit you don't really need to go there you just need to sort of learn this dance this dance that is paddling you know if you go on the disco floor or the dance floor 
everyone's dancing differently, but they're still getting the job done, right? <laughs> you know, so. I love, uh, I love that analogy, Steve. <laughs> um, brilliant. Um, so we've got a question from uh, Julia, and Julia's saying that she's confident on calm lake water or the flat Mediterranean Sea. Um, she's saying, what's the best way for her to build up confidence in you know the choppy English seas with slightly bigger tidal movement and a bit more wind um, how would you encourage um, Julia you know this is going to say again this is this is not well not too counterintuitive but for example one of the one of the things we've done in starting up paddle warning badly I think is that we've we've made sure people have 33 36 inch wide boards big wide boards you know so they're super flat ironing board flat potentially you know and we go out on nice flat water days. And of course, then we're confronted by some sort of movement of water. And then, we, then all of a sudden, you know, we're kind of freaking out. You know, we're, we're paddling with stiff legs and we're not moving like a gimbal, just learning to relax and go with the flow. And oddly enough, one of the, one of the best ways, strangely enough, is to get yourself a board that's quite tippy to paddle just in flat water. Get used to that rock and roll flat movement because you know, from there, a it challenges you and takes up takes up your skill level to another to another level in a safe, controlled environment on a flat water day. So that when you go to the rougher water, if you if you have if you have the luxury of another board that's a, that's a flatter and more stable, you can use that board on that day. You know, but at least you will feel comfortable. But of course, if you're always in an ironing board, flat, super stable environment, um, if you're suddenly confronted by by uh, choppy waters, it can freak you out a bit. How to handle it though, I mean, let's assume you, you know, it's not something you're gonna be able to do. Um, you know, you just gotta, one thing I say about rough water, you have to relax. And here's a tip, it is only water. It's only water, if you fall off, and you know what, here's another tip, most people don't fall off enough. It's only through falling you learn anything. And of course, everyone's so scared about getting wet, you know, because it's a bit cold and inconvenient. But actually, it's the falling off you start to learn. You start to push the envelope. And then you, then you stop falling off. You actually, you eventually get it. You know that you, logic tells you the ball's not going to flip over. It's going to move a bit. But you've got to move your legs. You've got you to loosen up, not stiffen up. So that's a bit of a tip don't always get out there and literally force it just do this make sure you move the board around see what its tolerances are see what its levels are you know learn to have this dance that i was talking about you've got to move with the board a lot of designers spend a lot of time and energy putting into boards that do dance and move and think and are intuitive and then paddlers get on them and freak out and go oh my god this board's crazy but actually that board's intuitive and it's thinking and it's trying very hard to follow a path that it was designed to follow and you're countering it, you're kind of fighting it the whole time. So that's something to consider as well. But um, yeah, yeah, to get out there and push ourselves in, in these uh, slightly different conditions. Um, top advice there, Steve. Um, Mark's asking, I'm, I'm going back a couple of questions now. Um, we're talking about paddling upwind. He, Mark's asking, is it beneficial to edge the board slightly when paddling upwind? or even on long stretches of flat open water. Yeah. Adding on to that is board trim. Can you explain the importance of um, board trim and edging um, yeah. for us? But listen, there's been a lot of, lot of stuff written, in the, well, I say a lot, I've, I've heard it on you know, a video a couple of days ago and I saw it on a thing or something written the other day too. And um, actually it was a story, it was something to do with um, Nordic, the Nordic style of paddling, which is very much a, where you keep your, you're not sort of, you keep your shoulders very square and you have this sort of fairly, you know, uh, robotic sort of movement is tied in with Nordic skiing. Anyway, that, that aside. Um, but listen, I'll go back to windsurfing. I was a professional windsurfer for some years. When we used to race division two boards, which are very narrow, a very narrow race board with a, with a rounded hull. And we learned to sail that thing upwind on its rail. You'd put it on the rail, and it did, it did a few things, which people are not, they're missing the point because they're not, they're not, they're not doing the hydrodynamics on this, not doing the mass. What happens is when you put a board on its edge, a few things happens. One is you increase your waterline length. In other words, you use pretty much the whole length from nose to tail it, because it, that's just how it is. The other thing is you reduce wetted surface area. This is the reality because you put it on the edge, all of a sudden you release the hole. Effectively, you just use it, you're on sort of a knife edge dagger. The third thing you do is you increase your, your, your tracking. It's a no-brainer. You know, all of a sudden, you're on a rail. 
Um, so what I don't get is why people are very, very intelligent people who should know better are saying, as soon as a ball goes on its rail, it's a problem. It isn't a problem at all. In fact, if you could learn to paddle your board on the rail upwind, you'd be faster than everyone else. No problem in the world, absolutely guaranteed. Technically though, it's very challenging from, a, from the paddler's perspective. On the other hand, I would argue very few people even attempt to or even are trying to learn that technique. But if you could, there would be absolute gains, no question at all. So yes, board trim is very important. Um, and of course, a lot of that all comes through footwork and being unable to displace weight between the left and the right rail. And I uh, guess there's quite a lot of really good drills out there that we can do to in, improve our movement um, on the board and alter the trim. Um, another question coming in here, Steve, what, what are your top three paddle tips for people just starting to paddle? Um, this is from Michelle um, and it's also Michelle's asked, um, how much flex should we be looking for in our paddle shaft? Okay. Um, <clears throat> rule of thumb, it, depending on what your background is, if, if, you're, if you're not of a background where you've used your body in, in, in this sort of way, where you've loaded up your, your muscles and uh, they've take, taken a bit of pounding over the years, you know, you're going you're gonna to want a paddle that, that has got medium to edging medium towards quite a lot of flex not massive amount but it, enough to protect your joints it's important you don't want a super stiff iron bar uh, to be paddling with that's for the realms of the for the super fit and strong who who have gotten used to it because you will damage yourself if you if you fail to have enough um, uh, sort of uh, give think of it as a shock absorber that's what it's there for the added advantage of a flexible shaft is the fact you have recoil. So when the paddle comes out under, under tension, when it exits the water, it has this natural recoil. So it's sort of boing, so it's, it wants to spring through into the recovery. Whereas a super stiff shaft, come, it goes in the water dead and it, it, it pulls you know, really solidly. But the trouble is it comes out dead too, and then you, you've got very little recoil. So then you've actually got, actually got to physically carry it through to the, to the, to the, uh, to the setup again. One thing to consider. Um, things to, to look out to do. Come back to what I said before, fall in a lot. <laughs> and that sounds ridiculous, but if you're not falling in, you ain't trying. You're just, you're just not trying hard enough. Um, I'm not saying that you're sort of so incompetent, you're just falling off randomly, but I'm saying that, you know, you've got to be sort of prepared to fall off. That's really important. Don't be scared. Put a wetsuit on, get used to the falling off process, but, because that will mean you are at least pushing yourself a little bit to, to see such things as issues of trim, for example, with the board. Um, stretching, you know, just get your body used to, to moving, you know, get this idea of, you know, twisting, you know, just put a paddle behind your, uh, behind your head and just, just experiment yourself on land to see how much, how inflexible you are or flexible you are. And, you know, take that onto the water, the idea of, of reaching out. I mean, put, for example, the idea of reaching and having a set point. So you might want to get some electrical tape and just put some electrical tape on the board and know that's where you want to plant your paddle every time. Put some electrical tape on your paddle so you know where exactly you want, where you want to put your hand. Because these are little, they're not just visual clues, but, then, but they can be tactile ones too, especially in reference to the paddle. Because you will get into bad habits very quickly. And you see, you've got to you know, be shown, well, this is where I'm aiming for on my board relative to where I'm standing. Obviously, if you just stood still and you're just working the blade, if you're moving around, obviously that, Gonna, that mark is going to change in terms of where you're going to put the blade. The other thing is to um, experiment with different paddle strokes. You know, there is an overabundance of information on how to do a forward paddle stroke. I mean, just this is if it's the only stroke that, that matters. There are so many other paddle strokes that 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 you need to learn because those paddle strokes will save you when you you, know, you should be able to do to paddle on one side for as long as you like regardless of what's going on pretty much you know if, if it's fairly fairly mellow day in calm water you should be able to paddle for three four miles if you need to on one side not well, you're going to do that crazy stuff but i mean that's the sort of thing you could do how do you do that by learning how the blade how the paddle works you know in how it interacts with you and how you use it as a tool because when you have these all these skills available to you you can do anything. This, you can pretty much go anywhere because you've got all these skills at, at your disposal. But if, you've got, if you're a one trick pony, you're gonna only use the paddle one way going forward and that's all you got in your toolbox, you're gonna be in a world of pain. So learn a variety of different strokes you know, that, that you're gonna need to, to use. Um, you know, and, and again, that's what keeps you engaged and interested in the sport. 
you know, it really is. Well, um, it leads me on to another question there, Steve. So you've had a highly distinguished paddling career um, and still paddling extremely well. Um, one, one question that's come from Sarah is, um, how has your, your own personal paddling technique changed throughout your paddling career? And Annie's also asking in relation to that. Um, as we get older, it obviously gets tougher to improve our competitive perf performance. Any advice on, on that front? Yes, look, um, <clears throat> I was only saying to Ben today, I was having a chat with him about this, you know. Um, you know, I, I've got my fair share of small injuries and uh, um, mainly a hip injury I've had that I can't, it's just there, I have to deal with it. Um, that's from steering big six-man outriggers for years. Um, been very lucky with my shoulders, but I do have injuries. And because of that, I've had to adapt and to actually change my technique a little bit. And I think this is the thing that, you know, people fail to, to understand at times that paddles, paddling is such a dynamic thing that of course, you know, you, if you start when you're age 20, by the time you're age 50, you can't be paddling like you were when you were 20. It's not possible because everything changes. Your body starts to fall apart in one way or another. It's probably a bit, of a, a bit dramatic, but not fall apart, but you know, aches, pains, injuries, things that you've have to, you've suffered. I've got a very long list of injuries that I've had um, over the years of paddling. Um, and um, I've had to take time off and then come back to it. But, you know, that's forced me to change. What can you do about this? Well, look, you know, again, we, we mentioned paddles. If you start off, a lot of paddlers will start, when you get from day one, if you're a beginner, you really need to start with a big paddle, a wide paddle. Uh, wide or fairly, or you know, as we were discussing earlier, something with a bit of meat in it anyway, let's put it that way. Um, I don't care if it's six inches long and 22 inches, uh, six inches wide and 22 high, yeah, as long as it's got some meat in it, but you need a bigger blade area because you see physically, you don't have the speed to, 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 to oh, compressing water is the wrong term, but to actually pr prevent the water molecules running away, if you like, so you're going to put the paddle in, you're going to pull like that for years and get used to that. And then you're going to, you're going to start downsizing. You're going to have a smaller blade. Why? Because a smaller blade, you can wield it faster. You can save a lot of energy on the exit and recovery. Uh, you can have higher stroke rates. There's a lot of benefits having a small blade. I mean, less is actually more in paddle sports. Um, but what will happen is that it'll force you to increase your stroke rate. And of course, as you, that's great when you're younger, but as you get older, unless you put on a lot of weight or don't, because you've been off the water, you got sick or something, but you know, over time, your aerobic thresholds go down. And because of that, you find yourself gravitating towards a slightly bigger blade area because you're going to slow your stroke rate down and you're not as strong as you were before. So those sort of issues. So again, the paddle, the tool you use is the thing beyond all other things that you can change. You have absolute control over on any given day at any time of, uh, uh, you know, of your paddling career, you can change that. And people don't actually experiment with that enough. So you've, you've got to learn to, to accept, you know, when you need to make those changes and you'll find it's a, you know, it, it's a massive, uh, it will make a massive difference. Yeah, the, um, the old classic shoulder mobility, shoulder injury, um, Karen's asking them, can, can I ask Steve, how, how could we improve the shoulder mobility? Because uh, she's, Karen saying she's better on one side than poor on the other. Are there any specific stretches, Steve, that um, could help with the shoulder mobility that, that you may, you could advise on? Um, yeah, there, there are, there are some very good ones. There's a, there's a lady called Gina Kenny, who has some really good um, stretching for, for paddle. She's an area canoe paddle herself. She's paddled for a very long time. She's a yoga specialist, but she doesn't get all sort of freaky on you, but she's all to do with uh, Pilates and other stuff, but she has a series of videos out about um, uh, paddling, um, paddling, stretching for paddling specifically. So Gina Kenny, that's G E N A. Uh, K E W N Y. Um, she lives in Australia, and uh, so if you can find her videos for certain, for sure, have a look at that. I trust her because she is a paddler, uh, not a fake one, but a genuine, a genuine paddler. Yeah, it's on. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I could probably put that on the WSA site, for example, and share that, and you guys can can have a look in there. But um, yeah, you know, 
it sounds to me like you might have that 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 could be an injury that you've got it could be from sedentary stuff but what, what i mean by that it could be because you're sitting all day and you're just working one side of your body and all the other it could be a whole bunch of things but um if you have an injury there an old injury then obviously that's going to require a little bit of extra effort and work if it's just a natural thing and it could well be a natural thing then that can be a bit challenging um the just a short thing i mean that you have the glenoid cavity which is a big hole a big hole like that in the shoulder okay and the bone fits in there when you when you're when you're paddling when you're raising your your arm up here that that space is being is is basically closing and there's a little sheath in here of a, a really nice sheath of skin protecting all the nerve endings now when you raise it, it the bone is doing this it's grating and the higher you go up the worse it gets because the you know the pushing down some people have a very big space they're naturally born a big space others are, some of us are born at virtually none so that's it takes no time at all to get to get to the position of having a shoulder injury so um shoulder flex shoulder injury is key do not injure your shoulders please because if you if you get a bad shoulder injury in canoeing and and, and stand up it's the holy grail you know it's one of those areas which is um a real problem so yes please go and Give good advice about that and so I'll, I'll try and share those gina kenny videos on obviously site yeah brilliant steve i mean other classic uh, injuries um, any issues actually personally any any issues with your knees when paddling stand up paddling have you have you had any uh, issues with those because knee injuries obviously mm. pretty important in the whole paddle stroke using our knees but um any experience with that one I, I've been, again, I've been, I've been a bit lucky, but I, I have, again, I, I carry all injuries from canoeing with that. But um, what I found with stand up is important. It, you know, one of the big, one, just again, it's a little thing I could throw out there. If you stand a little bit pigeon toed, you know, if you, if you, if you keep your, your, your feet inwards, um, that will help your knees quite a great deal. If you stand like that, it's going to be in a world of pain like that. It's neutral ish, you know, but like this, it does help. A, you get a better, you get better um, footing on the board in general, but you also get a better offset for your knees as you as you get as you go into the stroke. Um, and your you know your arm leg coordination is very key here to to prevent injury to your knees. If you're getting if you're out of whack with your the way your knees and are moving in relation to your hips in relation to your shoulders and so forth then you're going to get this disconnect between the two and then you start pull, pulling yourself apart so you've got to get those motions correct it's a bit like i was saying before with the dancing you know it's it's a question of getting that that rhythm and that that dance happening that actually makes sense and is sustainable you know and not feeling that you're that you are actually clumsy and you feel like you're not uh, you're out of sorts you know um so yeah knee injuries I understand fully where you're coming from, uh, but say, look, try and work on your feet position. Because you, again, your feet are what's connecting you to the board. If, if they're positioned incorrectly, you're automatically set up for, uh, for, for uh, good things or bad things. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just one more uh, question on this subject of injuries um, and just a little bit how we can help with that. Um, have you got any advice, Steve, for someone who's new to stand up paddling who, maybe struggling with stiff legs and, and we have the classic one with a the numb feet syndrome as well paddling over distance any any advice on on that yeah look you know numb feet over distance yeah that that's a good one but you know the thing is to is to is to know it's going to happen you know <laughs> the idea that it's not going to happen is not realistic i mean it's going to happen so what you need you do need to find yourself moving around on the board a little bit of board a bit, a bit so for example if you can learn to for example to switch feet when you paddle that's great and if you if you're naturally a, um you know if you're a, a regular foot or you're goofy foot whichever you are that's all well and good but you but you need and if you paddle with a little bit of bias which i believe i'm i'm a great believer in saying that you should i don't like this idea of you know feet feet together I, I like the idea one slightly forward or you know so forth like this you know and again toting a little bit but because that all sports all ball sports require feet your feet being offset all martial arts your feet are offset boxing your feet are offset it's, it's just a stronger stance it makes sense but if you can learn to switch feet too you know go regular go goofy go regular go goofy i mean look again it's that dance i'm talking about if you're going to stand like a statue you know then whatever's going to come, whatever could happen to you in terms of 
you know, sore knees and sore muscles and aching feet and all the rest of it, that is going to, it's going to come at you because all the blood starts to pull and it pulls down to the feet, you know, so you've got to keep yourself some level of mobility happening. So you've got to talk yourself into this, right? Move, move, move. Don't just stand there. Okay. And then that dance that you're doing on the board is always going to pay off because you know, you become more, uh, adaptable lady asked early in, the, early in the evening about learning how to paddle in rough water. If you're all solid on the board, uh, that's not a good thing. You will learn to move around a little bit. Okay. So that's the best, the best way to, to counteract um, numbness for sure. Okay. Th thanks ever so much for that, Steve. Um, just changing the subject slightly now. Um, Mark's asking T grip or palm grip and when, or when would we, when would we use each? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Okay, so um, again, this is a metamorphosis of what's gone on over the years. I mean, T grips have been around forever and a day. They're very basic. Get a piece of dowel, it's nice and round, just slice it, put a hole in it, and whack it on the top. Um, you know, there are variations of it. Um, that's this is actually called a hammerhead. You can see it's it, that's because it's got this beveled side. This, if, if you had two sides flat, that'd just be that's just your regular T top, but this they call that a hammerhead. Which is kind of nice because you put your, you put your palm, the palm goes into the, into there, as you know. So we wouldn't call it a palm grip, but that obviously is for the palm. Um, alternatively, you know, you might want to. I think this is more what you're talking about. You've got a, a proper. Can't quite see that little bevel, but you've got a. The pan sits in here, and the hand the pan sits over there. So the palm in there, and the fingers over the top. Okay, that's what you're talking about. Now, here's the thing. Um, in, in really rough water, um, where you're getting wet a lot, and maybe your hands are cold, the T-grip hammerhead style is a lot more positive. It's, a, it's, it's there, you know, it really does sit in the hand nicely. The problem with a palm grip, as comfortable as it is, when this puppy starts getting wet, I've seen, I mean, I've done it to myself, I've, I've the number of times I've nearly busted my nose where the hand has come up, just slid, it's just slid off the top like that and it's whacked me. In fact. One of the things we learn to do in our rigor is we'll, we'll wear peat caps, really solid peak. So when we, if that ever happens, it, it'll hit, hit the peak and yeah, hopefully save your nose. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, that's, that would be my advice. So, I mean, if, you're, if I was doing white water or those sort of things, I'd be going to tea grip. Not a problem, absolutely, 100%. If I'm doing distance, stand up, touring, go with a palm grip, something more comfortable. That, that's, that's more or less where I, what, I, what I'd be thinking. Okay, great one there. Um, Again, completely a different um, topic here. Where in the world, Steve, have you seen where the paddle is introduced at an early age? And that's also going to lead us on to another question that's come through. Um, we've, we've, some of us have read and heard um, about Hawaiian and Tahitian strokes. And would you be able to uh, give us a brief description of, of the differences and the variances in the two? Um. <clears throat> Okay, I think just to address the first one, um, well, <laughs> I mean, all, all the years I've read, my, I was been writing my books, you know, we had this, the, my, my publishing name is Canoe Culture, and it's called Canoe Culture for a very good reason, because there are cultures out there that literally are from a canoeing background, um, and from canoeing, obviously, there, you know, we can now talk about stand-up paddleboarding, but if you go to places like in, in Tahiti in particular, um, parts of Hawaiian Islands for sure, you know, you are seeing, or Fiji, for example, you're seeing kids that get bored into paddling. They are literally of a paddling culture. Uh, I never forget, forget once being in Bora Bora, riding on my bicycle, it was a th three hours to go around Bora Bora in Tahiti. And I stopped off and there was this little girl, she must've been three years of age, in a, a rudderless V1 21 foot Aru canoe on her own, paddling around out towards the reef, just three years of age with her dad. And she, her technique was just nuts. It was like, spot on i mean you just look go wow that's incredible and to think she's doing that when she's three because what she can do when she's 15 and 16 and these kids don't stop paddling they just keep on paddling as a lifestyle it's what they do for you know it's just what they do it's in the dna um look hawaiian tahitian uh, very again a lot of this comes down to paddles but t traditionally uh you know and again what they've done is they this is why i've always banged on about you know, because if you get guys like Dave Klarman, I was you know, from Hawaii talking about Hawaiian Tahitian paddling strokes and so forth, 
um, you know, they're digging into Auriga because there's no such thing in stuff. They, they've stolen it, the concept from Auriga, because this is what, what Aurigas talk about. We talk about Anglo-Hawaiian, Anglo-Australian, uh, sorry, Anglo-Tahitian, whatever it might be, all the mixes of paddling strokes we see. The Hawaiian stroke is big, long, lumbering. You know, it's a big, 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 big strokes and super hyper, hyper extension. And the, the part, the part of the reason for this was in Aurigas canoeing in the old days, they had rather, no no grips at the top super long shafts and they were just choking at the top which kind of actually didn't invent by the way because choking down on paddles has always been around forever for millennia um so they were choking down and then just these massive pizza scoops you know and they were just having to throw their body into, into the stroke very dynamically meanwhile and um, what happens is the missionaries came along, the missionaries came along about 1820, they shut the whole of Hawaii down, they said, right, no more paddling, they put away their paddles and they picked up their Bibles and started going to church and they just said, right, this is the devil's work and they just stopped hula dancing and everything. That, so no paddling for like 50 years. Uh, meanwhile, in Tahiti, the, the missionaries turned up, but the uh, missionaries uh, had no luck with the Tahitians. The Tahitians said, we're going to keep on paddling or basically it's going to be big trouble. So they, were, they kept on paddling. And because of that, they kept evolving and they brought in they got rid of their, these big heavy paddles and they chucked them away and went smaller and smaller and smaller. They actually embraced the idea of the of what they were seeing ultimately from Europe. And that was sort of, sort of in the you know, 1960s, 1970s. They were seeing what was coming, what was what, 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 and they never had any caveats and rules about things like that. But the Hawaiians were always keen to protect this idea of what canoeing should be. But the Tahitians always said, no, we just go fast. We don't, whatever count, whatever we can do to make go fast, we'll go that way. And so they developed a style that was very quick, fast, far more aerobic, lighter paddles, shorter paddles, and a, 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 a technique that was completely different to the to the to the Hawaiian way of thinking, and um, and it's proven itself over and over and over. You know, if you go if you look at the well, they're going to have to come to Outrigger, but with the Molokai results, they won Molokai for the last fifteen years. I mean, they're just so far ahead of, of what what. Uh, what's coming out of Hawaii and they've tried and they've tried and they've tried, but these guys are just so adaptable, so quick. Um, so you know, when it comes to standard paddleboarding, you can apply these things, you know, Hawaiian is a big, long dynamic sort of loping thing, or you go more sort of, you know, chop, 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 you know, which is more sort of Tahitian. Um, and now we have the idea of this Nordic style of paddling where you just, you know, you make it more like lang laufing sort of style. For, uh, so, so yeah, look that <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, and I tried to bring as much of this culture from Outrigger into SUP because it matters, because it's important, because that's, it's, it's relevant, you know, it's not irrelevant, you know, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, all this stuff is existing, it's out there, you know. Yeah, uh, um, Daniel's asking, um, uh, have you got any experience of comparing the movement of modern cross-country skiing with that of stand-up paddling? Um, I don't know what science has been has been done. Um, I have followed the eleven cities for about five or six years now, and the, and the with the House Luzo brothers, you know the Hungarian boys, you know they have a very Nordic style. What's become termed uh, Nordic, and I think that um, you know Casper Steinforth was one of the guys that possibly uh, gave the nomenclature to it. You know, it's this idea that you're sort of, you know, it's more sort of, it, there's less of this of this going on, you know, and it's more sort of this going on. It's sort of more straight down, if you like. Um, to my way of thinking, it's not as talky, you know. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing about the outrigger style or C1 style of paddling is a, there's a lot more talky. Well, there's a lot more body rotation, rotating around the spine, engaging those big core muscles. It's a very different sort of motion, and it, it you know it's technically quite 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 challenging this nordic style of, uh, is quite um is possibly a little bit easier technically because i mean there's not there's, there's a lot less there's a bit less going on you know um but again it's not still not easy but it's just another way of looking at things i worry a bit about it um because what i see if i go back to the, the brothers the hazilo brothers they use both like the gun goes and they're they're outrigger they're more sort of you know it's more like big 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 sort of uh you know, reaching and twisting and then and then they'll sort of it'll it'll sort of come back and be more for doing the hard yards they're like this you know but if they need to go up up the rate there's sort of there's definitely length coming on they're bringing on that length so mixing the point here is know it all mix it all up if you need to you know um 
and again, you know, recreationally speaking, you know, let, let's not get carried away. Let's just look at whatever is going to work for you. Um, but in terms of racing and if you're going to go from flat water to downwind to surf to river to all these things, you got to, you have to know it all. There's not one way. You just have to, you've got to dip into all your toolboxes. I'll have this one, I'll have this bit, I'll have this bit, and then put it all together on the day. Yeah. Do you, do you see a change in blade design in the future then, Steve, to accommodate these, this um, mixture of styles and as, as, as the sport develops even further, do you, do you think we'll see a, some big fundamental changes in blade design? Well, we should. We absolutely should and we haven't. And it's kind of a wonder that we haven't. Um, you know, there's always been this argument about, you know, is, pad is, is stand up paddle when they're paddling a paddle sport? And we're crying out loud, it's the dumbest question in the universe. I mean, of course, if there's a paddle sport, if it isn't, then what the hell are we doing with the paddle on our hand? End of story. It is. And you, in the absence of surf, you, know, you need a paddle, period. Um, the issue is that there's also this been this push, as we know, there's still no rules that define it, but we're, we are getting more and more towards where we are seeing uh, the high levels of, of designs going towards more canoe-like things we, that you stand in. And it's all very well to push the envelope on that, but of course, one thing that's, that's definitely um, falling by the wayside is panel design, no question about it. We're still stuck with teardrop style predominantly paddles, where some are a little bit more high aspect now, but we want to go to something that's Look at that thing behind me. That's a that's a paddle from Madagascar. And that's the big tall, that's a hand hewn thing that we've been cut out, which a very close friend of mine gave to me. But um, you know, you go back in history, do your do your, if you look back to the Africa the Africans, you look back to uh, the, the, the the Indians and others around the world that are still standing and paddling in the Fijians. None of them, none of them, they have three, they've had three, four, five, six thousand years of of, of, of of uh, involvement in standing and paddling, yet they've never considered once to make a teardrop style thing that we use. They, their paddles are profoundly, they're more like that thing against the wall. So my question is, you know, <laughs> isn't the answer right there? But yes, absolutely. We don't use double bends when we could. We just use, we only use single bend paddles. There, there are things that, that should be looked at. I'm 100% agree, in agreement with that because, you know, a long, a, a narrow, long shaft uh, blade gives you the ability to put in as much or as little as you want you know you can utilize it in any way that you choose i want all of it none of it some of it you know yeah you know, we've, we've mentioned quite a lot through uh, this uh, webinar about the different countries um in, uh, different paddling nations um what and where is your number one paddle destination, Steve, and why? Uh, if you had to choose one, <laughs> that's, uh, uh, and all of the places you've paddled, you had to choose maybe your top three, what, what, what would you say? Oh, um, I think the most, spe most spectacular is probably Huahini on the island, which is one of the outer islands of, of Tahiti. I mean, as a place to go to Fariara there is just mind blowing. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in my life to live in many places in the world and travel to many places, but Tahiti is one place I just can't get enough of. Uh, so certainly Huahini would be right up there uh, for me. As much as Bora Bora is very nice, I still think Huahini has it. It's just more, there's just more going on. Uh, the water is just insane. Uh, the, the reef's incredible. The surf's great. Um, you know, it's just a beautiful place to be. Um, there, there's downwinds there, all sorts you can do. Um, Fiji is very nice. Fiji has a lot of uh, a lot of mix of things. If you get go to the right places, I mean, great open water paddling there. You've got you've got some nice rivers to explore. Uh, going, especially going coming down river too is very is possible there. So that's that's a beautiful part of the world to go and visit. Most of my bucket mark, no, not bucket list now, but I mean, but my best places are gen generally in the Pacific. Um, I think, you know, when I, if I think about closer to home, you know, again, you know, there's, <laughs> it's going to sound crazy. Well, no, 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 that's not crazy at all. I'll take that back. You know, what could be nicer, I think, probably than, you know, meandering your way down a river in England somewhere on a beautiful summer's day and over a couple of days. I mean, there must be some incredible paddle paddling uh, scenarios here that I have, personally, I've, I haven't done that. You know, my whole life's been on the ocean, but I'm absolutely aware there's some fantastic, uh, opportunities to do some inland river uh river paddling and, and that could be that they might be the shortest great places in switzerland all over the world but uh 
I, I would love to do something inland uh, for sure. America has some incredible places to go and visit and to, and to paddle down downstream for sure. So um, yeah, and I, I, that, that's my one regret, probably not having done enough river paddling. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think the list is endless and the choices are endless, aren't they? Uh, for us paddlers, there's beautiful, beautiful spots that we all um, hope to visit someday. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up in a minute, Steve. It's been fascinating insight having a chat with you um, and, and listening and taking all your advice on board. Um, we had a couple of questions about how, how can, what's the name of your, could you just remind some of the viewers um, the name of your book and how they could actually purchase this online um yeah we will we can post this on our wsa facebook as well but if you could just remind remind us um all right so this is the um the, so this is, the screen's around the wrong way but stand up paddle um paddler's guide and um it's big <laughs> it's um it's crazy big it's like 500 pages big and uh you know it really has got uh yeah, we've got some great sections on. We've got great sections on downwinding. Uh, we've got some uh, a lot of technical, um, a lot of technical images, um, and we talk about things that uh, the sort of typical things that, that that you do, which are often easy to do, and then we talk about things that are harder to do, and then the th typical things that go wrong. You know, so again, it's all arrowed and explained to you. Um, so th th there really is a huge amount in there. So if you, this book, if you were to go to, and that's called canoeculture.com, which is just K-A-N-U. So it's canoeculture.com. Um, from there, you can see all the books that, that, uh, that I've written over the years. I've written a few, but this was a, this, this took five years to write this book. And, um, you know, what I, what I say to people is, look, this isn't the Bible, the gospel according to Steve West. It's not what it is at all. What it is, is the culmination of a lifetime of paddling and a lifetime also of, of research um, that, I've, that I've managed to do. But also, you know, you know Travis Grant's on the, on the front here. Well, Travis is a guy who, you know, he's, um, he's a personal friend of mine. I grew, he sort of, we, I grew up a little bit with him together. I mentored him a bit with paddle. Paddling was a young guy uh, in Australia. And... Um, but you know guys like that contribute to this publication that were to all my publications that were written now it's not just me you know I, I don't have not that much knowledge in my head to be honest but you know putting it all in one book is, is a great start okay so but you'll find it very helpful what allows you it's a great reference book really and one of my jobs has always been i've always felt is to try and cut through all the white noise and just nail things down i'll never tell you something in there without a without i won't just give you a fact i'll tell you why there's no point saying do it this way. That's no point, no point in that because you're only going to do it if you understand the meaning behind it and then you actually apply it. Otherwise I wouldn't expect you to do it. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's canoeculture.com, isn't it? You said K A N U. Yeah. Canoeculture.com. Yeah. Stand up paddle, a paddler's guide. Yeah. Um, it's a fantastic resource for, for those of you who haven't seen the book or heard about it. Um, 100% recommend getting that for your library. And in this lockdown period, what better way to <laughs> educate ourselves? Um, yeah. So that, that, that's wrapping things up uh, for everyone here, Steve. Uh, just on behalf of Water Skills Academy, um, just like to say thank you ever so much. It's really been an enlightening uh, webinar for us. And I, I think this can, can, will continue. It's been very popular. There's endless loads of topics that we can talk about and i'd just like to apologize to people if we haven't had uh, the opportunity to answer all the questions that have been coming in um so we will we we have got further um friday sessions coming and we've got wednesday development sessions everything's online um on the wsa facebook page and the website and and we will be holding a, a symposium which is open to all paddlers of all disciplines um which is coming up in october it's actually in your backyard steve in hailing island as you as you know and um steve will be there doing doing a presentation on downwinding and techniques so that will be um really really um something to look forward to in october so on behalf of everyone um steve thanks ever so much really 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 interesting and some great comments i wish you could see them all online that's um, right. I want to say also thanks, Krista, and also to the WSA for all that they're they're uh, they're doing and, and for inviting me this evening. So it's a great pleasure to come and uh, 
put you all to sleep and stop horrific experience. You will go home now and think, God, that's over and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay safe, everyone. Hopefully we'll all be um, back on the water sooner rather than later. And um, hopefully we'll see you again joining in on another web uh, webinar um, next Wednesday or Friday. So take care. Thanks ever so much, Steve. Over and out. Pleasure, guys. Good night. Bye. Night, everyone.